I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. items on the agenda and I felt like the, it wasn't necessarily worth it. I mean, y'all want to hear, he's always willing to be here, but I uh, uh, figured we would take a little funding that. If y'all want to hear, no matter what, just let me know. That's kind of in the past, you know, for us to I mean, the fuller agenda. Okay, first item on the agenda was the approval of the minutes from the February the 27th meeting. So moved. Second. It has been moved in a second to approve the minutes from the February 27th meeting. with the clerk please call roll? Adam? Yes. Lock? <coughs> Abstain? Driver? Yes. Stipe? Yes. Next item on the agenda will be approval of the statement of the bills paid in the amount of 172 76981 Mr. Mayor, I'll make a motion to pay the bill in the amount of 172 76981 Second. It has been moved and second to approve the, uh, approve the statement of the bills play paid to the clerk of these calls. Adams? Yes. Malak? Yes. Shriver? Yes. Stein? Yes. Next item on the agenda will be request for comments from the public. There being none, we will move on to the next item, which is the City Council to consider ordinance number 981, establishing nuisance alarm system to the public office. Uh, Chief Patrice is going to take the lead on this and I think turn it over to uh, a member of his staff. Yes. <laughs> Sergeant Kelly will be presenting. This is part of his capstone project from the, uh, the easiest way to reference it is a certified public manager program for law enforcement. So uh, in conjunction with KU and the Kansas Law Enforcement Training Center, uh, somewhat in, in its infancy, infancy but uh, we've been uh, Sergeant Kelly was the first to go through for us, and we have one uh, Doug Kramer contending now. This is part of his capstone project that we talked about early in his start of that one-year program last year. And as a result of it, uh, Sergeant Kelly's experience with this particular issue, uh, not only understanding that other communities in the metro area have the same problem and address it in very similar ways, uh, it is an issue for us, time-consuming, not very efficient, and is somewhat dangerous. So uh, he has done the research and may give you some of that background, but uh, he's going to, uh, he asked to be, uh, just uh, kind of carry this forward and make the presentation and to get some experience uh, being in front of the council and things like that. So we'll invite Sergeant Michael Kelly up to make the presentation. And the only thing I would add is Mr. Kelly comes up uh, that this is also a, a, a fire related issue relative to alarms, so we're talking false alarms, and I think they also noted that mm -hmm. that's on the uptick in the <coughs> organization wide. Mr. Taking the lead for us. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, City Council. Uh, Chief Matisse has uh, said that last year I had the opportunity to attend the Law Enforcement Leadership Academy Command School where I obtained my certified public manager certification. To complete this course, I had to complete a capstone project, and after consulting with Chief of these, I chose to research nuisance alarms, which is a trend that we are seeing in Edwardsville. For the past three years, um, officers have responded to 676 alarms, and only one of them has been due to criminal activity. Of those, of those alarms, 613 were false alarms, and the others were due to uh, either alarm command canceled the alarms, or due to uh, bad weather. Out of those uh, alarm locations, or, we responded to 160 locations in Edwardsville would have counted for the 613 false alarms. And the top 15 of the alarm locations that we responded the most to accounted for 51% of the false alarms that we had. Response to these false alarms by the police and fire department warrants an emergency response, which exposes personnel and citizens to unnecessary risk. Reducing this, such, reducing this risk is a uh, priority for the city administration. I have researched the process and procedures uh, by, with the other cities in the Kansas City metropolitan areas and I, to, to address these concerns. 
and a numerous of the cities in the metropolitan area, including Kansas City, Kansas, have adopted an ordinance governing nuisance alarm systems. With this adoption of this ordinance, alarm users will be required to register their alarms at no cost with the city. The alarm registration will provide a database which it will show who the alarm holders are and their contact information. I responded to an alarm here in Edwardsville, uh, uh, here in Edwardsville that was not monitored by an alarm company. How we got notified to it was because the caller had said that his neighbor's alarm had been going off and it was his audible alarm was blurring through his bedroom window. When we got there, we found that the homeowner was not home, and since the alarm was not registered with an alarm company, we had no way to contact the alarm holder. Therefore, the alarm continued going off. Another alarm that I've responded to here in Edwardsville is a local business. It was after hours, and when we arrived, we found that the front door was unlocked. We asked the alarm company to go ahead and notify the owner to have him come out to secure his business. When the alarm company called the number that they had on file for the responder, it rang to the Edwardsville Police Department. <laughs> With the alarm registration, we would have the alarm owner's contact information on file, and this would reduce time that police and fire department personnel would have to spend on the scene trying to locate a responsible party. Alarm users would be held accountable for maintaining their alarm systems in a proper functional manner, which would reduce the public safety response to these alarms. Residential and business alarm owners would be allowed to have three false alarms in a calendar year, and at the third false alarm, a fee will be assessed. Another example of alarm that I responded to here in Edwardsville, it was a reoccurring alarm, and we went to it several times a day. Finally, we asked the alarm company to notify the owner of the business to have them respond out to the location. The owner of the business told his alarm company, I know it's a faulty sensor. I'll only show up if the police find something, I find a problem. Meanwhile, for a couple of weeks, we continued to respond to that same resident or the same business for the same faulty alarm, wasting officers' time for an alarm that could have been avoided. If the alarm owner had, had, was faced with the potential fees, and this would motivate them to possibly fix their faulty alarm system in a timely manner. With the adoption of this ordinance, the fire department and the police department will appoint an alarm coordinator to track the, the alarms. Alarms due to criminal activity, fire, or weather related will not be considered a false, a false alarm. And the appeal process will be in place to where the, so a person can appeal the findings of a false alarm. With the ordinance in place, the fine can be levied upon those who are charged in municipal court and convicted for violating the mandatory provision within this ordinance. In closing, the staff asks, recommends the adoption of ordinance number 981, establishing a nuisance alarm system for the public office. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> is there a difference in the fines, or is there a claim to be different than fines between the companies that are registered and aren't registered? There is a, fine, a fee in place to uh, where an unregistered alarm could be assessed a fee as well. Every time? Yes. So you can be unmonitored, but still be registered? If you choose not to use an alarm company, that is fine, but they're still required to be registered to the city, so that way we can track them, who you are, we can contact you if your alarm is going off. We do it on our business license, and I'm not sure all the information, but some of the businesses will give us that information with their business license renewal, but I wouldn't say that's uniform. And, and not every, again, sometimes that data is aged. <coughs> it's not a requirement, per se, other than some of the businesses. We have a section on there, if they have alarms, to give us the information, but there's no requirement. Is this fee consistent with other cities in our area? Uh, compared to fee, uh, Kansas City, Kansas has two different fees, one for residential users and one for business users. And I've also compared it with Lenexa as well. And, and it is consistent between kind of falls in the middle of all of them. So this fee would be for residential and business? Yes. So it, it's the same? You guys are distinguished between the two, differentiate between no, the two? No, it would be the same. In your experience, are you responding to more false alarms in homes or in businesses? In businesses. Um, there are some homes, but in the three-year study that I did, there was not a single one of them that ever exceeded three in a calendar year at a residence. All of them uh, were, that would have been a violation of this ordinance for businesses. Okay. Okay. 
Is there a difference between a, a what would be a, considered a police alarm and a fire alarm from the building? I mean, like who responds? How many units are going out on, on these false alarms? Uh, on the fire side, that's just for my curiosity. Yeah, it's on the fire side. Here you can see everyone's well, getting all five. It's getting the bumper and the angels with all five personnel on top of myself or Mr. Burr uh, if we're here. The police officers are usually notified of the alarm, and sometimes if they're not tied up on another call, they'll be making the call or not. If we have to force entry into the facility, then we have to wait until the PD shows up for them to force entry into it. So, you know, for us, like I said, it's a minimum of on duty crew and five personnel to the main bumper and the main angle on respond. And they do respond. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Every time. Like I said, unless we're canceled um, by the alarm company while we're in route. The same thing as starting Kelly found out. The majority of our calls are in the businesses compared to the residential. Um, our residential homeowners that have act, uh, alarm system malfunctions usually are averaging three or less per year as well. To give you an idea, we ran to one one company in one day five times this past year. The same faulty detector. So it is a problem on both sides as well. Is there any idea of the cost per call? I could get that back to you on what it would cost for us um, specifically. I mean, I know it's a lot more than what the proposed fee is. I was going to say, it's got to be a pretty good chunk of change for us to leave the, the station. Yes, sir. Police and fire. Yes, sir. But I don't have it directly off the top of my head what it would cost me to send out that entire call. One, one thing I would say about a little separation between police and, and, and fire. So <coughs> buildings that have sprinkler systems and there are certain size build, commercial buildings by the fire code, we can, we are required to have uh, those alarm systems and sprinkler systems depending on their size. So there's some technical piece that's in place for those. But on uh, a business alarm or or home alarm, there's, there's not really any technical requirements. If you want to go get an alarm system for your small business or house and have it for one of the major alarm companies, and then you can get a I just want door alarms, which you can get. Generally, they come packaged with some kind of a smoke alarm and, and burglar alarm and things like that. So sometimes it depends how the dispatch will come out. So some of the more sophisticated fire alarms will say the alarm's going off that's in, you know, section 12, you know, the rear door of the building. I don't know that on generally on your general police type alarms that you get that. It's more like there's an alarm going which might trigger both agencies, depending on, on you know, how a call comes out. But I, I know that just from my knowledge, that, I mean, the commercials have been in the biggest areas. And, 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 and answered my question, uh, you rock and roll when you hear an alarm, yes, basically. And if you, you got to assume it is what it is. You can't ignore it. Yeah. If you recall the office max fire in December of 2015, initially come in as an activated fire alarm, and it was upgraded to an activated water flow alarm. And then it was a follow-up phone call from the office or the facility manager to the dispatch center that they had smoke construction. And another follow-up call that they had an actual fire construction. Um, also underneath the uh, fire code, the city council adopted under Chapter 5 uh, a little over a year and a half ago. It was already a structure in place, you know, by the fire code. For our situations, for commercial structures that have a smoke detection or sprinkler detection system, they're required to maintain the systems. We just never had the fee schedule put in place that said this is the number of calls that we'll allow, this is what we're going to be implemented at. So, I, and I think it's important to understand the difference between the fees. So, you can have you can have three or four false, let's say you get your, your fourth false alarm and that fee is $50. It's a fee, it's simply assessed. You could still have a situation where if they don't maintain that alarm and they they're not actively doing things, or it's a you know their let's just say that their uh, alarm system at a building that's required by the code isn't being maintained or it's not operational, there could still be citations, which is is a different situation. And the citation you basically have to wait till you go through the court process and have some finding of guilt. Where in this, it's literally you've had this many violations, you're assessed as fee did. So, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, it's kind of like getting a sewer fee, right? You, you, you pay uh, for a service, 
and but if you don't maintain your sewer system, you could be cited through through a violation of the code of ordinances. So it's it's kind of a, has two components to it. But this is primarily about how do you say you missed this? You know, if you've gone this many times, so so it's not that we've only gone once. We've gone four times now. You know, so on the fourth time, we've gone four times there for fifty dollars. So for twelve dollars and fifty cents, and that has come out there four times. So I, I, I just understand that's a fee versus a fine in that sense. But you could potentially have both. I mean, it, it's not the likely scenario, but if somebody had 10 or 12 and they continue to do things, uh, they could become a nuisance and, and there could be both the fee and the fine, which a lot of things could have that. Well, if, they have a, if they have a false alarm like that, it's going to get to where the people in the buildings are going to start ignoring them anyway, and they might be in there when the building is burning down. That is always the problem. I, I taught in high school for years, and the fire alarm, sometimes you just say, well, I don't smell any smoke, just keep on working. Yeah, we're having that problem now in two of the facilities we have here in the city. We'll get the call and pull up, but there's no evacuation going on. You walk in, and staff's like, okay, what's this another false alarm? So. Chief, when you go do your inspections at the buildings, do you check on the alarm systems? As They're as required that? every year to have a third party come in and, and test the system. Um, the only time that we physically witness the test every year is when there's been an expansion to one facility part of the occupancy permit that we're issuing or any portion. Um, when the crews go out to do the inspection, they're supposed to have their alarm walls or their maintenance books there. Um, the majority of our facilities are having them serviced and maintained and, and do have the testing to it. Um, but again, you know, it, it comes down to we still have a few that are not abiding by the rules that should be. What happens if you go on your inspection and they haven't had that? updated or up kept there? Well, it depends upon when it's done. It's not required to be done until it's in that 12 month period. So we have some facilities that's always done in August. Um, and then if that's the case, we will go back after uh, the middle of September to re verify that the alarm system is tested. Uh, Herb Jones is just one example. You know, it's always in good standing for our alarm system, but they're, they're a lengthy year of maintenance when they do all their extinguishers and protection systems. Sprinkler test, so that we always go back in in October to test or, or to re verify they had the testing done. Sergeant Kelly, did I understand you right when you said there were 676 responses, 613 of them were false? Yes, sir. And only one real one, which I assume is not. Uh, that's, that's off his back. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. There was one real one about three years ago with uh, status. <clears throat> okay, that would be the this is really troubling me. It's obviously it's causing us a lot of money and time and, and potential of taking our safety equipment away from serving the citizens of the, of the community. How, how are you planning on rolling it out and getting the companies ready or everybody who has an alarm registered? Well, we would uh, send out with business packets from businesses and when they do the license at the beginning of the year, they could walk into the station, uh, the city hall, the register. Um, Possibly maybe even put it online to where they go to the city's a web page and they can register online as well. Try to make it as easy as convenient as possible for people to do. What kind of a take uptake time are you talking about before you start implementing the fees? There'd be a grace period at first um, to get people used to it. Um, I haven't really thought about the actual time frame, but obviously we want people to be aware of the system. Um, when maybe when we go to arms, we can notify them. Hey, if you're in your folks alarm, just want to let you know we have this ordinance now. We need to start working on to get it registered and come into the well, Will that be done to all citizens, even though you know, may not know whether they have an alarm system or not? How is this? How will this be implemented to be notifying everybody? Well, I, I think that's it's it's going to be an educational process. Okay. Because we we you know, so we have businesses in town understand that may not have a fire fire system in it, so. It, it would be different, but I, uh, we would have to notify people. But I mean, we have like daycares and all of our businesses, we at least have a business license process. So we could use that as one mechanism. It will probably be more difficult for <coughs> residential, but uh, we would also notify the alarm companies. Because some of them will call actually before they do alarms 
and say, do you have an alarm registration system? And if so, we'll take care of it. So some of your, I would say, your larger, more rapid <coughs> alarm systems will, are used to and expect that there will be a registration. So I think we can contact, you know, without maybe promoting uh, any particular But I mean, there's several large alarm systems out there. Probably, you know, the smaller systems, uh, those are probably more difficult for a completely unmonitored alarm system that just the homeowner put in one. You know, those well, are probably the most this challenging. This one can be stuff like hot shot. Two oh, times, I, you know, yeah. two or three times. Yeah. Yeah. And also, the 108 facilities we do are the 108 business licenses we have here in Edwardsville. Now we're starting to kick that off with the inspections. So yeah. we're going to be able to walk in as part of the inspections with the information package if this ordinance is approved. Identify them that if they have an alarm system, whether it's a fire alarm system or not, that this is an important. We do have some daycares that do not have uh, protection or specialists for them, but we feel like to protect them by the state and codes because of the nature of the facilities. So 108 of those facilities we do have business licenses on that will be in within the next 30 to 90 days as part of the first portion of the inspections. So that's, that's an opportunity for us as a whole to get that packet or information out without dropping off to the responsible party when we're doing the inspections. So you know, we're either the facility manager or the plant manager, whoever do, does the maintenance. And, you know, we can sit there and definitely put that out as part of our inspection process. This is coming down. Here's what has to be implemented by it. And then start gathering some of that information while we're out there for a thing. And I think what he's alluding to uh, is that the known are the easy, the business ones, especially those applicable to the fire code. And then on the police side, we run alarm calls. We have an alarm record already. So if we've been to your house, we would have that in our data file for most in most instances. So we, we keep a we do an alarm card for every alarm we already run. That's, we have a database already built for that. It's part of our records management system. So we could run that list, and uh, which would include the business, but we can also do the resident residentials as well, as long as we've kept a record of them. And then those that we run, for example. You move in, you're new, you install a system that they either your own or some other company and they didn't call for us. We run the alarm there. That's how you discover. Okay. For example, we go to a house and there's a child care facility there that's not registered. That's one way how we figure out, well, you need a business license. That's so it would be some of the standard routine things that we would do. We give them notice, you must register, and we'll fill out an alarm card anyway, so we'll have them on record. And what that does is from the police car, you push the button. You run the name, you know, again, if they're registered properly, who that, what's their cell phone number, you be their owner or some other alternative contact. And we hope through the, like, the vacation home check program that we have, they fill out a lot of information, so we do have that information that way as well. So if somebody does go away, they do have the alarm, we may have that as a vacation home check as well. So there's a number of things that go in, and we do have the data at our fingertips. So as, as, as comprehensive as we can have it. <coughs> I understand the great you to contact those people, send out a, a registration application, let them know about the new, and, and, and I think a nice cover letter with explaining why it's it's to better spend their money, you know, better invest their money in the city and the safety of the city and the, and the safety of the personnel and the employees in town too. So. We will look at the options of best ways to get the word out. Put that together. Choose to I'd like to make a motion to approve ordinance number 981. Second. It has been moved and second to approve ordinance number 981. Yes. So uh, I, I want to be clear on a couple of things. So cancellation and route, how will that be handled? Um, if you're called off of the call because the alarm company is able to reach responsible, will you? Uh, Will you still respond? Will you? Are they subject to the false alarm and the fee, if applicable? If the alarm company notifies us prior to arrival and cancels the alarm, uh, we will not continue to respond and will be not considered a false alarm. Okay. It would only be considered a false alarm as if we have already arrived on the scene before they cancel it. Okay. Of the 676, 613 were not good alarms. And when I say not good, I mean uh, we're false. Uh, so that leaves 654 that you guys uh, responded to that were not uh, that were false alarms. 
were they in any way notified that uh, you guys did respond, you were at their property, and uh, that they had an alarm go off? Sometimes door hangers are left on the alarms. It depends on if we find an open residence or not. If we find that the residence is open, the business is open, and there's no one around, we'll leave a door hanger and let them know that your alarm went off. We were here, we checked the residence, we didn't find anything. If you have a problem or if you discovered something after we left, please call us back. And if we find it secure, um, there's a good chance they might not know, know it unless their alarm company uh, notifies them. But I've also seen history where alarm companies uh, have not notified businesses before. And when I've contacted them about official alarms, they had no clue that the alarm would be moving on. Got a variety of things that you have to deal with. <clears throat> okay. Then um, also, um, um, so the collection, if there is a fee assessed, who will, how will that be handled on the uh, collection of the fine? Who will get it? How will we enforce it? How does that work? I'm not sure we got all the two. You said fee and fine. Fee. Yeah, yeah. What, how, how, what, fee. How are you guys? This false alarm. Yeah, false alarm. Uh, would be, it would be assessed. They would be notified. Simple process as we would almost invoice if you would. And then it would just be a collection through the city hall. And what teeth are in that additional thing? Your business license and the number is of that, that would be contingent on your, your business license? Your business license can be removed okay. for any number of factors. So if you want. They also could be, at that point, they are still then in violate. I mean, if they fail to correct or do, there is the potential under this that they, they could be cited, but obviously there's a court process involved with that. Right. And it would be violating the code by not registering and not maintaining. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a little bit different path, but regular billing, we would handle it like we do other billing types of activities. We have, we have an invoice type system. <clears throat> so if someone new moves to our community, they buy a house, they have no idea about this alarm setup. They, they have an alarm company come out, they have an alarm go off, it's not a good alarm. They have three of them go off, and, they, and, and then finally they find out that you guys have been out there and there, there is a registration. Do they get fined at that time, or will they? Is there a grace period for the somebody? Um, you know, how how would they have known that they needed to register their alarm? New alarm users will be allowed a 30-day grace period and up to four alarms, false alarms, whichever comes first. And we'd be communicating with them at this point. We'd be telling them, hey, listen, uh, we know that you're new. We have an alarm registration system here. Give them information about uh, where they can register their alarm and keep compliance out. Okay. Okay, other questions? Is the clerk please call roll? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Adams and Adams? Yes. Noah? Yes. Driver? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, okay, so. Well, unlike the last couple of times where I tried to pick the winner of a basketball game, I, I'm not that succinct tonight, but I'm still trying to keep it succinct. Uh, I think I'm going to do the last thing uh, uh, for the end. Uh, the first thing that I would say uh, from a good, good news is we were contacted by the uh, uh, Village South development team and they have asked to have a groundbreaking on March 22nd. I think each of y'all were contacted and there was a general, uh, everybody's day at 11 o'clock on the 22nd. So we will be moving forward with that and making other notifications and, and working out the details and we'll, we will get that out to you. Uh, so uh, that's a positive right, that, they're, that they're moving forward. We have gotten their uh, revised, revised plans on the public improvements, which would be the sewer and streets and internal, the internal streets, and, and so those are under review now. Um, I, I anticipate that those are probably pretty close to being ready to go. Uh, we're focused on the sewer one first because it has to also get a state approval process for it, and, and so we'll get those kind of things knocked out. Uh, we have, I, I think we were saying, uh, the next council meeting, we will have a number of uh, 
items come before you that are development related, which will include the MedArts expansion, which is 45,000 square feet or so, and that's their building. It used to be called Midwest Engine, and it'll be next to there. Uh, hopefully they've got their alarm system fixed, because I remember they used to have a number of pieces, but I haven't, I haven't heard that one in a while. Uh, but, uh, so there's an expansion of that building, uh, and then Fast and All, uh, as you know, uh, is building a new automated hub, what they call a hub, and so it's physically a building, and inside it is basically racks and uh, robotic types of systems go fix pieces, and then it ships it across the conveyor belt into their existing warehouse where it would be loaded on the truck. So it's a about a $20 million project for uh, a fairly small building, probably 20,000 square feet or so. And most of it's all internal equipment and mechanized type of stuff. Uh, we are proud and happy that Rick is back with us. He started back on the 7th. Uh, and he has been active, and I'll, I'll let uh, Zach touch on this in a minute, uh, about uh, uh, working on some of the code enforcement issues that were raised in previous meetings, as well as some that have been outstanding. So uh, we're glad to have him back and work on that. Uh, and then uh, the last, uh, well, I tell you what, I'm going to let Zach hit one, and I'm going to come back and talk about the quiet zone briefly, but I'll, you had a couple items, Zach. Touch those. Yeah, a few items. First off, the as a follow up to tonight's year end presentation. So, what we'll do next uh, to get this information out to as many people as we can is we're going to be posting a video of this discussion similar to how we do the city council meetings. <coughs> uh, we're going to be including the information that you see that, that, that you've got in front of you, the infographics information. We'll be distributing a special edition of the Hot Shot on Wednesday of this week that people can access and, and see this information and we'll also post it online um, and also we'll, we'll probably do some extra work in preparing it and, and putting it out there for anyone who wants to request a copy. Um, so that's, you know, kind of our next step in trying to be proactive in getting uh, the Department of Accomplishments out in this front uh, of as many people as we can. Um, as Mike mentioned, for uh, where it's really hit the ground running. Uh, I think he was itching to get back to work. Uh, since he's been back, uh, he has uh, provided updates on 12 different addresses where violations have been identified. He's completed field inspections of, of each of those 12 addresses. Uh, he has follow-up discussions scheduled and re-inspection dates scheduled. Uh, he's either been in contact person-to-person uh, -person with the people living there or he's issued a letter. And so the, the wheels are all in motion for in that respect, uh, kind of a similar or related issue uh, um, to uh, kind of neighborhood cleanup. Uh, since our last meeting, I've reached out to the Wyandotte County Sheriff's Department, and they have indicated that some of their inmates would be available for any uh, localized neighborhood cleanup program that is configured to develop one, which uh, myself and Public Director Snyder have been kicking around some ideas to target some of the areas around town that we've got that as an option. There's also some uh, a group at Shawnee that uh, uh, provides day labor as needed. So we're, we've been playing around with some of the options to target some of the uh, problem areas in town. Um, the last thing I'll say, and this is a little of a fun note, so we've been involved in the RKM's Hometown Showdown Challenge. It's kind of a bracket system for each community. It's 64 communities and they submit a picture and uh, they, they post, the LKM posts it on Facebook, and the more likes you get, the more you advance. So we are in the third round of that. We've beaten the city of Toronto and the city of Pittsburgh at this point. Uh, the next round, we go against a really nice-looking picture from Newton. But what we got in, in against Newton is he has unfortunately left, but uh, EMS Supervisor Burr and the kitten that he saved two years ago. Uh, is the picture that we put out there, and it's gotten probably over 500 likes to this point. Each each round, it restarts the count. Uh, but if we win, the picture gets put on the cover of uh, Kansas Government Journal, which goes out to uh, all of our peer communities and, and elected officials and city staff. So that would be a really neat kind of feather in our cap to have. It would be the first time that I'm aware of that Edward will be on the cover. <laughs> Certainly the first time that Tony's been on the cover of any magazine. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, that all that information, we'll take that out with the hot shot too. So we're we got our fingers crossed on that. 
how we named the kitten Tigger, by the way. <laughs> Tony and Tigger. So, uh, that has been a good, I mean, I've been, I'm going to say the Newton picture to me doesn't look like any place I've ever seen in Newton's <laughs> The snowy scene. I'm not sure that it's, I'm not sure it's not. Yeah, 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 it's not. It, uh, the, the other thing that we had just talked about all is, is that we'll probably be starting the remodel portion at the front right. end here of the city hall. Uh, its primary purpose is to kind of put that security system in, move court over, and, and, and kind of give a, an additional level of security. Additional level of security and also some ADA compliance, bring us right to, to the counter. Some, the counters for court, the counters across the way will be a. ADA level counters that are higher than they should be. And so as we make these improvements, we're keeping those kind of things in mind as well. Hey Mike, I was wanting to find out uh, the progress on the um, lift station yes. up off, off Riverview. The, um, it seems like it's been kind of, not a lot of progress has been happening. And, and it, I guess it might have been today or yesterday uh, that their, pa their uh, power poles, or telephone poles, were delivered. Um, are those guys on track, or what's the what's well, the yeah. schedule on that? It, I um, mean, we, you know, we had originally hoped to have that done by, you know, right. pretty much the first part of the year. Right. What, what, so it is somewhat off track in the, in the sense of when we wanted to have it done, uh, but it, it came down, it was a power issue, and so we had anticipated everything being three-phase power at that point. Uh, and basically, Casey Goodell, yeah, for whatever reason, it was, well, if you want three-phase power, you know, it's a $200,000 ticket item. Uh, and that wasn't really in the cards. So we converted to a single-phase power source, but it had to make some adjustments to the lift station for the power, so they're, they're back to the like power converter, taking it from single phase to three phase. Now, some of those costs will be covered by most of those initial costs will be covered by the development by the, the development there. Uh, KCPNL uh, basically all the installation they're doing is free. There's some underground conduit things as part of our project that, that we have to cover. So. It's been KCPNL needed to wait a little bit to make sure what the power source was going to be. And then two, we had acquired easements up there, a, a, a permanent and a temporary easement, a 20-foot permanent and a 10-foot temporary easement. Uh, we, we believe that it was sufficient for both the access road and the utilities. KCPNL didn't think so, so they acquired their own easement on the opposite side of the road to the chain, which, which actually probably worked out better. Uh, so it's away from the fence and the vegetation. Uh, so just those things today. Now as far as the lift station, uh, the physical lift station itself, uh, again, no reason to get it there too early with, until we get the power there. Uh, but I would expect that we'll see the physical lift station within probably the next 30 days. Uh, now, no, I wasn't so yeah, much concerned yeah. about the actual lift station. It just seems like things have set they have, they for quite they, some they, time. They, 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 yeah. I was wanting to see yeah. what the, what now, the progress was. Now, we do have everything. That the only thing that's kind of outstanding from the lift station around to so its tie into Little Turkey Creek is all that's in place. Uh, it's still under the slip, you know, erosion mm -hmm. control plan, uh, but that'll probably be seated here in, in I think March 15th to April 15th or May 15th is the KDOT seating time. Uh, sometimes I wonder, but, but that's, the, that's the seating time. And we have to, uh, uh, in the manhole where we connect in, a requirement was to have that, that manhole lined. And we had the, the contractor ready to go, but there's another manhole on the other end that has to be lined. So so I don't think there's any delays relative to our portion of the project. Uh, now, uh, there are still ongoing discussions related to easements from the lift station to 110th Street. That's, that's ongoing. It, it, well, now, I, I wouldn't even bring it up since right. you did. Yeah. Um, is that a developer responsibility? 
Yes, the, the, because it's a public e the easements are in our name, so you know, ultimately it's it's our responsibility to obtain them. They have the financial responsibility to do that. So, uh, and, and I know that there's some people in the audience that are dealing with them, so I don't want to you know, put anybody on the spot. But I mean, I, I, from what I understand, there's been discussions, and some of them are completed, and some of them there's been valid, reasonable discussions that are ongoing. I, I have personally heard of any significant problem. I mean, there's some, I don't know what we're talking about, but from that standpoint. So what I do want to uh, bring forth tonight is, and I gave you a copy of this letter that we received uh, from uh, County Administrator Mr. Bach regarding the uh, implementation of a quiet zone that basically starts in Bonner and goes through Edwardsville. Uh, I did reach out to the Wyandotte County because honestly, I was not aware that there was movement to go to the next phase uh, and said, what is this and what's going on? Uh, I did have a meeting today with uh, engineering staff at the UG and, and Olsman Associates, which is basically the consultant uh, on this work. What they have said basically, what this does is kind of puts the railroad on notice and gets the railroad started on uh, looking at it as a real project. Uh, and then it goes through a period of time when the railroad will come back with what they think their costs are based upon plans and then, you know, at that point, somebody has to pay for real engineering uh, and, and so on and so forth. What I said, uh, I, I think we should respond to the NOI. Uh, what I have said to them is we're not opposed to the quiet zone. Uh, our concern has been and continues to be is how is it funded both short term and long term. And you know, that, that generally speaking, we have just as they do, I'm sure, we have priorities, and, and our priorities may or may not align with this. Um, we have some concerns. Uh, so there's been some discussion about some of the property down where the uh, private crossing is now, about possible development, how, you know, how would that impact if that's the place the crossing is or isn't. Uh, the fourth street, we're in the middle now of doing this study uh, to look at that further. We know there's going to be a railroad there. We know there's going to be pedestrian crossings there. Uh, we're not going to redesign the quiet zone, but you know it, it potentially impacts what we're doing. And since all of these crossings except one are in our city, we think we should be sitting at the table during any and all discussions about this. I got a whole huge problem with it. Yeah. Right. I mean, when when we're being dictated uh, by the UG and uh, I mean, we have, don't we have a commissioner for this area that would be updating us and keeping us apprised of what's going on? I mean, I I I think this is it's terrible that we that we get a letter saying that we're going to do this improvements and this I, I can't remember what the initial cost was, but it was huge. Well, the, the, the estimate that was put forth with the study that was done with K-32 for our crossing, now that those, there's adjustments in there potentially. Now that they've added swings to the road, it may change how the private crossing, but, but it was in the two and a half million dollar range for Yeah, and, for, and, for and, and that, that was just the install. Then we got maintenance, right. and, and, and I, I, I don't know, I, just we got, don't know. I, I got a problem with uh, getting a letter saying this is what we're going to do in your city. And, we we're, and we haven't been at the table, just like and you just said, I was surprised that we didn't think this was even moving forward. Right. The staff indicated that uh, when they met today that this was not a indication of any level of commitment. What they stressed to us was this was essentially the formal way to uh, reach out to the railroad, like Mike mentioned, and, and make it and get it on the railroad's radar. Now we. I think everyone has issues with the notification process that they uh, they did, but that the, the two things that they, they did stress coming out of the meeting was this is not a commitment that this project is definitely moving forward. This is our the, the prescribed way to 
uh, notify the railroad and get their wheels well, and it, it is a step. To, what, what I read right here, the person who point of contact during the quiet zone development process will be Brent Thompson, the director of engineering for the Unified Government. That's correct. That's not a, that's not a railroad personnel. Right. Here. The letter oh, was to the railroad. Brent tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Captain, I mean, that, that's, a, that's been a concern of mine from the very beginning, is this kind of dictate type of thing. And, and uh, we, this needs to be yep. a unified government, including the other unified governments. Right. Or the other two governments in the county. And so, uh, yeah, this and it needs to be a, very much a cooperative effort. It's not appreciated to get uh, you know, a top down approach like this. And no, I think no pun intended, but to get railroaded. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that got, I, I could say that, the, and again, from a staff standpoint, I mean, whether it's Brent or uh, Wayne, I mean, uh, they were given direction. Right. They're, they're doing the job. Uh, I, I think. They, they clearly know uh, this, uh, and I think Olson was very clear as their contractor at this point, uh, you know, that, that, that this needs to change. I, I think, uh, you know, I let uh, others speak, but uh, I, I think we should, in my opinion, I have no problem doing this, that we should at least... Uh, respond to the to the NOI in, in this time frame that you know we are now aware of this and express some of our concerns about costs and ongoing you know what the ongoing maintenance what our responsibilities will be uh, that we be you know that we should be part of the planning process from the input part of it. Uh, I don't know that we're quote opposed to a quiet zone. I think it's a it's a matter of process and how What's what's going to be our liability? And, and at this point, I don't think they have any numbers that they. You know, I was one of the like we don't know what the number is. I have no idea what the unified government's position is on this. But what I what I heard today was there has not been a a commitment by them either to do the quiet zone. So as far as to, they haven't given direction to the staff or the engineering company go out and develop this. But it's certainly a step in the process. It is the first step in the process of creating a quiet zone. So, it, Who, yeah. Then who's pushing it? Because it's on UG letterhead. So who's pushing this then? If it's, not, I mean, I, I, understand what you're, I, I understand what you're saying. It's got Doug Fox signature on it. Right. And I mean, would, would, it, would it be appropriate for me to respond? Uh, yes, sir. I know that you have. You had some some additional, and I didn't want to speak in your behalf. Um, well, um, it was initiated by Commissioner Walters. Yes. Okay. Uh, we've already had one meeting with with Doug Bach and Commissioner Walters and some other staff members, and I expressed my opinion then that this, I could not support a mill and a half increase to pay for a quiet zone that we didn't want. And that, that our citizens are being asked to, to pay for the maintenance cost of almost 60000 a year for somebody that doesn't live in Edwardsville and is not going to pay for it. I've already expressed that. And I'm doing that again publicly. <laughs> and we're scheduled for our next meeting within the next I believe you're having a meeting with the, the mayors and I don't know what the staff is. Well, um, I'm certainly they I responded. I responded that you would be attending that meeting with Okay. I'm fine. I wasn't I wasn't invited. So I'll be clear on this on my on, on what little I have to say about it, but I'm not opposed to a quiet zone. Right. I don't want to pay for it. Right. If 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 the UG feels like this is a project that they want to do and pay for and maintain, but we should be at the table during the design process and, and what's going to happen within our own within our boundaries. Right. Not I just this is what we're going to do uh, and we're going to Because it's not just the cross, I mean, you know, the railroad looks at the crossing. So by that I mean from between the gates, right? So the, the physical rail crossing and the gates and anything in there. Everything outside of that are public streets, are public streets, right? So whether it's a median, whether it's Side, a sign, sidewalks, line, all of that is is 
some public, some mm -hmm. right, well, and, and the railroad doesn't pay for the crossings. They, generally speaking, uh, I mean, there's some some different. I mean, it depends, but uh, you know, but but generally, the, I mean, railroad's position is I have been for a long time, and I know you all heard this, but you know, their number one priority is safety of separating trains from cars and pedestrians, right? And one of the primary safety features is the horn. Right? I mean, that, that, that's why they have them on there. So anything that reduces safety, in their opinion, they don't generally, are not going to generally support financially or otherwise. So, so that, you know, there's the, the railroad. So it does require somebody requesting the five them, but they're not going to pay, from what I've heard, you know, they're, they're, they generally are not going to contribute to it. Now, if it's a crossing that needs to be rebuilt for other purposes, or you're closing one and relocating one, then they might contribute to those. But, uh, well, uh, and, and like in the married, comments yeah. that I know, um, don't need to be re repeated in public because they're not authority from the railroad. Right. I've just heard the concepts that they've had, and I don't know whether this meeting on the 21st is going to deal with some of that concepts because if According to the information I have, the railroad will be present at that 21st meeting, and that's why I want like to go with it. Seems like we're yeah. on the same page. But I don't, um, but there again, um, I will reiterate to them, the council, and my opinion about the citizens of Edward Hill Pen for quite its own, and it doesn't affect us. I mean, it affects us, mm -hmm. but there's no, not, over all the years I've been here, uh, this is a about the third or the fourth study for a quiet zone, and it's always a, it's too expensive. Well, the train didn't, and, just didn't get put in. Yeah. It was there when people moved yeah. there. I they knew there was a train track yeah. beside the yeah. house or down the street. They knew trains were going to hump their horns. It's just come, it comes with, you move by an airport, they're going to your airplanes. Well, and, and you bring up another thing. I mean, while you may silence the horns, trains are loud. Yeah. I mean, you you're, you're still have noise. <coughs> but. I think if I have your, and I think I hear the direction of the council, and I'll, I'll uh, work through the mayor, but we will put together a a letter of, of our concerns as it relates to this, and to express our desires uh, to be present at the future meetings that we're discussing. I mean, it, these these development or these changes in our we state initially state. were. I, I attended. Two of those meetings, the quiet zone meeting. So I guess once we uh, voiced the, and we're not too interested in it, then we'll, we'll just bypass them. Uh, but anyway, would that letter be uh, available to council? Would you yes, I will send that oh, to no, our email so we got I will put you letter. on there so they. Okay. You know, I, okay. When I send out something on behalf of the city of Vaults Council, I will always put a copy on there for you. So Thanks. because I, I need them to know too. Right, that, that you're aware of the situation and you are in. I'm not going to speak on behalf of the council without consensus. So. I, I was invited to the meeting they're talking about because of my involvement with TTPC mm -hmm. and, and you, you know, the, going through that system. And that message was, was communicated very loudly during the meeting. In fact, it kept putting some people on their heels and that's, So I can attest that it was conveyed very loudly. Yes. Okay. Good. Good. <laughs> With that, I have not, okay. I, I, I knew that was going to be the one take time, so I think okay. I've covered everything I need to cover. Blood pressure's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Send us out. Uh, Chief, <laughs> Chief of the Thank you. Thank you. Chief Whitter. Uh Just an update. As we talked about earlier, increased run volume. I already seen it this year. Uh, today, this afternoon, we made our 214th call. This time last year we were only at 165, so we're about 9.5% increase uh, again this year. Uh, one of the big things is we've had two structure fires uh, in the last 30 days. So uh, be confident that you know, we still have that, that there was some increase and so on. Thank you. Thank you. Across the board, that's yeah. probably true. Thank Our public works director here, you don't have anything to, to put in for her? Uh, nothing okay. specific. I mean, there, there, you know, a number of things that getting ready. Uh, we were all ready for the snowstorm Saturday. Uh, loaded and ready. It didn't show up. Uh, didn't show up. Uh, that twenty minute drive. Zach was. Uh, you know, somebody had to be called in the middle of the night. Uh, okay. Zach was better than me. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, I, I, they've got some pothole patching and things like that to do. Uh, 
you know, probably as far as on bigger projects, the, the LTC is still there. The 102nd uh, Riverview intersection is still going through planning and, and, and some processes. For the what? 102nd Riverview. Uh, I'm sorry. 102nd really? in Richland. I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, 102nd in Richland. The, the project was over in Yeah. So uh, there's very few properties there. So uh, that, that we're dealing with. Do so. you have a time frame on that? Uh, well, we're trying to finalize uh, the right of way acquisitions here by the end of March. And we had discussions with everybody, the company, and uh, utilities are pretty much ready to deal with relocation as soon as they have proper access. So we'd, we'd like to bid it in early summer, late fall, late spring, early summer. I mean, it's a fairly Quick project. There's not a ton of grade work. I mean, there's some underground work, but there's not a lot of change in grade on that. Kind of like a little bit right when you get to the intersection, kind of a little bit right there. Yeah. Uh, that's hey, all I'm aware of. Maybe with the council there. report. Welcome in the space. We'll start with you, Sergeant. Great job on the presentation. And you can tell that you had uh, that you'd done your homework on it. There's some few questions at you that I that I do. And, I'm, and, and I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Um, Chief, I'm glad I, I'm, my heart goes out to the family um, that lost a loved one in the, in the fire. I'm glad that our, uh, our staff is, is good and, and I'm hoping that if there's anything that any of those guys need uh, dealing with that, that we are doing all we can to support them. Um, Chief and Peace. You're still on it. Doing good. Um, trash, and you, and you addressed the trash. It's still there. Someone's dumped a uh, hot tub uh, under 98, uh, 98 and 435, and the other half of it is on Riverview. At, uh, at, Our so, guys knew about the one that had the bridge and, and talked to me about it this morning. I'm not sure if they. Well, the other, the other part of it is on Riverview uh, between 98th and, or between 102nd and uh, 435. Yeah. It's only a quarter of a quarter. Yeah, it's, it's a corner. Still, lost his train. What's corner? Um, too long. All I don't know. So, uh, the, the last thing, uh, I'm going to drag it on, but where are we at on lighting for the futsal court? We've got, um, so the next step for that is we are going to be reconvening the parks board at the uh, February, excuse me, March 21st, the so next week. And that's going to be on their agenda as we gather data as far as what it will cost, the, the cost that we gathered so far from the electric company, what we would need to do as far as power upgrades for the shelter, um, data related to what the UG has done with the existing football courts and if, uh, if they were converted from old tennis courts and if they've got any cost with that. And also we uh, are pulled, and I haven't reviewed yet, we pulled the existing we have the 40 KC, which has some, uh, from what the parks director, the UG parks director has informed me that there's some notification of, of, uh, of if there's improvements done or modifications done to the football courts and there's a prescribed process that's in that agreement. So the Parks Board is part of their first meeting of this year is going to be reviewing that. Uh, if it comes to something they want to pursue <coughs> with um, special sales tax dollars, for instance, there is, we've got kind of modeled out what that would do based on the cost uh, that we know about so far. And they would review those costs as similar to what we're going to try to do with the Parks Board is make it more of a part of the uh, process for special sales tax. <clears throat> Which is what, what, our, is what it said when we adopted that, that so the money spent for the special park for special parks would be reviewed by the Parks Board and, okay. and, and they could make a recommendation. So, so that will be on their docket for the next meeting. Thank you. Well, as usual, I echo what many of the council members say, but I will. I would like to add um, a thank you to Sergeant for your report, um, and Mark and Tim and Mike, obviously, from our fire department, police department, administration, everybody's super busy, and 
I'm glad. I think everybody's in agreement as far as the quiet zone study or implementation that this is so far at the bottom of our list of wants and needs that this city should even be addressing at this time. So I'm glad we're sitting in on where we stand on that. So. That's a ditto for me. Uh, the quiet zone, I've, I have my own issues with the quiet zone because I'm one of the unfortunate people that lives next to one that is a private crossing that is gated and locked 90% of the time and I have to hear the whistle, but I can't see spending $2 million to fix that. I think the railroad should really try and cooperate a little bit more than they do across the whole United States because if they do that at every crossing there is, there's going to be a lot of deaf people around here in the next 15 years or so. Yeah, some of the engineers have got attitudes. Huh? Yes. <laughs> and when you were at my house for two hours the other day, not one single train went I'm by. I'm sorry, I thought it was quiet. There that must have been a derailment. <laughs> there was a derailment somewhere. <laughs> the other thing is, uh, thank you for the reports, okay. the annual reports and so forth. You guys. You know, I don't think you don't ever think you're not appreciated in the efforts that you do around here for us. But like I say, it makes it an awful lot easier for us to sit up here and say yes or no to certain things because you've done your homework and it's pretty easy to say yes to you most of the time. Growing season's coming. You know what I'm going to say. Need to think about a articulated budget. Yes. That is on our list with uh, Ms. Snyder. <laughs> Yes. Kind of piggybacking on that is, it would be kind of nice maybe to send a letter to Deffenbaugh reminding them that they made a verbal commitment to clean up along the highway, and it would be great for them to do it before the mowing season starts, yeah. so that stuff doesn't get shredded into a thousand pieces. Uh, and it would be beneficial for our mowing equipment and the state mowing equipment not to have that stuff wrapped around the, the blades and so forth. So. Um, I think that would be a good call to make. Um, I, I also think it would be maybe appropriate for the, the residents of the North End to be notified specifically about the groundbreaking. You know, those of us on the North End have been, we've had project after project after project that we've had our hopes up on and so forth, and I think it, this would be a great celebration for for a lot of the people that are involved in those conversations. So, we'll do our best to try to get that word out there. Yeah, it would be great if we could. Um, I did notice on that area of the road that we're going to be replacing very shortly, that we did a couple road patches. Our, oh, uh, I think the utility did, uh, you're talking about on 102nd Street, yeah. but not in the new section. No, and the old, in the section to be ripped out. I think they did some, uh, the gas company had some, <coughs> I don't know if they potholed it or they had some repairs up there. Yeah, cut out. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and there'll probably be, for the water line, there's going to be a couple of potholes. If by that, they can drill a hole and they suck the stuff out because they want to make sure exactly where the water line and depth is part of the engineering. Okay. I did notice that too, and I'm not, I, I, that's what I understand. Uh, but the utilities are, are already engaged in the process. I just want to make sure we weren't investing our funds in Right. That was one of the questions I asked about the water act specifically about are they going to relocate the water line? They don't, you know, and it's expensive, but they don't want to relocate. It generally depends on the depth, the condition, and age of the public water line. And so sometimes they run under rooms. Preferably not, but we have that Sergeant Kelly, thank you very much. Really appreciate that. that that's pretty startling numbers. And that's a, I mean, we need to, we, we focus our, our assets in other places other than running false report or false calls. So thank you very much. I appreciate your investment in that. Department heads, I, this is always a really humbling time of year because it keeps getting better and better and better every year. And I really appreciate your leadership in your departments. And, and uh, we've got a lot to be proud of. A lot to be proud of. Most of the time. Thank you very much for your leadership and your leadership.
Mike, for your leadership, leadership overall. Greatly appreciate it. I'm fortunate to have a good council and a good team. So. Hey, I don't think I need to pat anybody on the back any more than they already have. Thank you all very much. And